Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. You're all looking very fine this Monday morning. We'll see what you look like on Wednesday when we finish uh, this conference. Um, for those of you who haven't met me yet, I'm John Smith. I'm president of the International Federation of Musicians, FIM, and it's my uh, honour and pleasure to chair this conference, although I'm not chairing the sessions. You'll have your moderators to do that. Um, just before we start, just technicalities. The headsets, you can switch them on with a button at the front, and then you can adjust the... Uh, volume with a slider and the channel the other side. Uh, channel 1 is French, channel 2 Spanish, channel 3 German, channel 4 English. And if you're bilingual or trilingual you can interchange just to make the, uh, the whole proceedings go with a, a bang. So it's my great pleasure to uh, open this conference and invite our first guest speaker to the stage uh, from one of our host unions uh, FMV, the president of FMV, Mrs. Agnes Jongerius. Agnes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed, my name is Agnes Jongerius. I'm the president of uh, the Confederation of Trade Unions of the Netherlands, FMV. And it's my honor to do an opening address at this important conference. Um, music, and I must say especially classical music, plays an important role in our culture. I think you can say music accompanies us through all of our lives. If I sit in a hall uh, listening to a classical performance, I feel in a way connected to many generations that preceded us, who enjoyed the same music. I feel connected with their aspirations, their emotions, and with their search for beauty. Nevertheless, music is also work. It's beautiful work. Sometimes it's hard work, and it's indeed very labor-intensive. And that's one of the reasons why many governments focus their eager eyes on culture and music to economize. And then music also becomes trade union work. In the Netherlands, the government wants to cut the budget by 80 billion euros. And art and culture are also on their list. Our country's uh, artistic community has decided to mount a stubborn resistance, and I would say rightly so, because government's target is out of proportion. Art and culture threaten to lose as much as a quarter of their budgets. And for performing artists, like orchestras, <coughs> cutbacks could also amount as much as 40%. And that means that many people will lose their jobs and it means that what has taken years of blood, sweat and tears to construct could disappear without anything to replace it. And that, my dear friends, is an erosion of our inheritance. And it is a destruction of capital. Orchestras will disappear. And the first impact will be on audiences on musicians and on other who work with orchestras. But also economy and society as a whole will suffer because the economic affair, uh, economics, uh, the economic value of arts and culture is enormous. A vital cultural and music uh, musical in infrastructure is important is an important reason for companies to establish themselves in a region. Culture attracts well-educated workers 
essential to a company continuity and uh, innovation. As trade unionists, we distance ourselves from simplistic solutions from populists. From them we hear proposals to use money from art subsidies for, for instance, more health care. And that reminds me of Sir Winston Churchill's famous words when in a parliamentary discussion about financing the war, a member of parliament proposed doing away completely with art subsidies. At which point Churchill retorted, what will we fight for then? Art and culture together form our mutual conscience. They give our multiform society a recognizable identity. If we let that slip away, what are we working for then? The credit crisis, do we remember, arose from wrong decisions by banks and insurance companies and too much market thinking by politicians. But now it seems that the population in general, ordinary working men and women, have to pay most of the bill. It's the same in culture. At the same time, they, the politicians, promote more free market operation for culture. Our government, for instance, <coughs> want to use the public as a departure point for art policies. In this model, it seems to be more vis visitors equal more subsidies. And the government also wants that art establishments, like for instance orchestras, to glean more, market, more money from the markets. So as to become less dependent on governmental contributions. And I have no quarrel with the intention here. More earning more money could, for instance, lead to better working conditions and better working circumstances. Carefully keeping track of economic parameters, parameters keeps organizations sharp, but also watch out. Figures can also lead to wrong conclusions or to political games. In that case, they damage artistic development and quality. A policy of too few visitors, there are therefore no reason to be there, can also lead to monoculture, can lead to what we call music for the millions. And what I say is, André Rieu, I don't know about you, personally I admire André Rieu, with his appeal to millions over and over again. But I cannot say that all of you must become André Rieu clones, can we? All the developments directly influence your work as musicians. Less subsidies and more markets means controlling costs, including labor costs. And as a trade union woman, I also have seen before what happens then. More production for the same, or perhaps less money, with less people, up goes work pressure and up goes the risk of permanent abstinence <coughs> and incapacity for work. My trade union is fighting for safe, healthy, and pleasurable work for years. Cut back and rising market orientation form extra obstacles to safe and healthy work. All this becomes even more important considering the current discussion about retirement. We all live longer. 
and that's wonderful because you could say you have more time to enjoy nice music. That's true. But to make our pensions affordable, we also have to go to do something. And the question is, can workers really go on working? And if not, what happens then? That's an important question for all sectors with high performance risks, like for instance the orchestras. In many places we cannot and may not finance early retirement any longer, so we have to seek other solutions. But how can we adjust your work so that musicians can go on working longer in good health. The margins for prevention programs within orchestras are very narrow at this moment and the individual is subordinate to the collective. The entire group must produce a performance of a superior quality. Maybe the answer is a second career, as in the dance world. There, the end comes at around 35, which is not true for the orchestras. But anything like that, anything like a second career possibility, certainly will require subsidies and a good social safety net for musicians who cannot go working any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, I've pointed out briefly a number of subjects for your working lives. I think it's a wonderful initiative for, of the FIM to create this opportunity for musicians and managers to discuss, to learn from one another, and to return home with new ideas, new thoughts, and new solutions. I wish you a very inspiring conference. I wish you a productive conference. And I hope with all my heart that you will retain the space in the future to elevate our world with your art. Thank you.